I'll go ahead and say it. My guest today has written what may go down in history as the book on habits. James Clear. Next. Hello and welcome to 1% Better. I'm your host, Joe Ferraro. Thank you so much for being here. You are in the right place if you want to unpack the mindset, language, and behavior of daily improvement. Today, it's the 1% Better Habits Edition with James Clear. I hope you'll forgive my enthusiasm. James was one of those bucket list guests. I learned just as much from a New York Times bestselling author as I do from someone who is not yet famous. James just happens to be in the category of someone who has been prolific and someone who I have admired. And the best part of all, you are going to get an absolute tremendous amount out of our conversation. Before we get too far and get into the conversation, I want to thank everybody who has subscribed to the newsletter. It's 1% Wednesday. It goes out every Wednesday at 9 a.m. Eastern, followed up at night, 7 p.m. to 7.30, over on Instagram for an Instagram Live where we'll unpack the episode of the week or anything that's on your mind when it comes to getting 1% better. You can find me on social media at Ferraro on Air and all things 1% Better at 1percentbetterproject.com. But the star of the show and the reason you're here today is James Clear. In my hand is Atomic Habits, Tiny Changes, Remarkable Results, an easy and proven way to build good habits and break bad ones. I admire James's work. You'll hear that in the conversation. But much, much more than that, you are going to hear value bomb after value bomb. And I hope at the end, you'll become an unrecognizable person when it comes to the study of habits. The book is that good. Please enjoy my conversation with James Clear. If you're a listener to this podcast, you either know my guest's work or you're about to do a very, very deep dive into it. You might know his work from the New York Times, Entrepreneur Magazine, Time, CBS This Morning. But I know my guest's work first as the pride of the Denison University, Big Red, a member of the pitching staff, academic All-American once upon a time, James Clear. Hey, th thanks so much for talking to me, man. I'm excited to chat. Yeah, I know. I know that you won't have too many baseball questions, but but as someone who played college baseball, there's some parallels. And uh, I wondered to get us rolling. What was your out pitch back then, man? Because I know that you start the book with some baseball stories. And I was curious, you know, pitchers love to talk about their craft. <laughs> yeah, I um, well, I mean, the good thing is uh, I was able to get a little bit better each year. And so by the time I finished, uh, I had three pitches that were decent. I mean, none of them would like, you know, light you up, but it was, uh, but all of them worked well together, but, uh, definitely my two seam fastball was my bread and butter. That was what I lived on. Um, and, uh, yeah, so I don't know. It's always fun to talk about this stuff. I actually was just talking to coach Deegan, uh, yesterday and, uh, he was excited for us to chat as well. Yeah. Isn't it amazing to kind of, to kind of work Mike in, he's been a huge uh, resource to me and I know that you've been back. It's funny. The two seam fastball is, uh, as many know, if we haven't lost them, it's a craftsman's pitch. It's a pitch that runs in. And, and I wonder about that as a parallel to think about habits. You've written a book that I hold in my hand, Atomic Habits. James, man, I, I feel like when this one left the hand, uh, not to belabor the image, this felt good. I mean, everything I've seen from you, you've been incredibly humble and you've been just consistently moving forward. But this is not only a physically beautiful book, but this is a resource that I think will stick around for a long, long time. Oh, well, thank you so much. I'm, I'm glad to hear that you enjoyed it. You know, I mean, for me, this is the culmination of I've spent the last three years specifically working on this project, but really it's the culmination of six years of writing and research overall about habits. And I mean, I, you know, I, and this is true, I think for many people for the big projects they choose, but I wanted to be um, ambitious with it when I set out. And my, my goal was to write the most comprehensive and practical guide on how habits work, how to understand them and how to apply them and design better ones for your life. And I think that Atomic Habits is that. And my hope is that it will continue to be that, that I can update it as time goes on and continue to refine and improve the ideas. Um, 
And so, yeah, I'm very excited to share with people. I, I think you'll be hard pressed to find a more actionable book on what it means to build better habits and what that process is like. Well, yeah, when you when you subtitle it in easy and proven way to build good habits and break bad ones, you're positioning yourself as as all about practicality. And it, and it is that it's very interesting that you use the word ambitious, because sometimes when we hear that word in parlance, we think of these flash. I think people think flashy. I think people think sometimes showy. And if people go to your website, which I'm sure they have, jamesclear.com, it opens up, hi, I'm James Clear. I, I had to go to the second page to find a picture of you, James. <laughs> and, and I know from following your work for a long time, that's 100% deliberate. So you kind of have a relationship here between ambitious goals and work, but stripping away to the bare essentials, it appears to me. Well, here's the thing, though. Like, what do you want to be ambitious about? Um, you know, like I'm not to be perfectly honest, and this sounds may sound somewhat strange for someone who has a site called jamesclear.com. I, I have very little interest in being well known myself. Um, you know, I, I don't I have very little interest in being an Instagram celebrity or YouTuber or some kind of like brand. Uh, what I want are for the ideas to be famous. Uh, I want the work to like lead the way. And so you're right. My site is minimally designed and laid out like in a very intentional way. Uh, it's very, a lot of white space, basically just white uh, background and black text. But the reason is because I don't want to hide behind anything else. If the words aren't good enough to hold your attention or to teach you something new or to, um, capture your, your energy and enthusiasm, then I need to write something better. Um, and so, uh, in a way it kind of, forces my skin in the game and uh, forces me to stay on top of my craft and make sure that the the thing that's most important is sharing great and useful ideas. And so uh, the design is is one way of kind of forcing my hand in that direction. Mm. And, you know, as someone who's followed your work, that's 100 percent apparent. Question occurs to me, though, how did you get comfortable enough to know that that would be enough or to hope that the ideas would be enough? Um. Yeah, good question. I don't know. Uh, you know, on the one hand, I think maybe it's a, a, the opposite. It's being uncomfortable with sharing my personal story or having my picture front and center or things like that, that kind of like nudged me in that direction. Um, but then there are also like positive aspects of my personality that kind of pull me there. Like, um, I've always been fairly curious. Uh, I really like learning. I, I enjoy it. I like asking questions. Um, and I don't know. I'm not sure if that's like me personally, my personality, and there's something about that, or if uh, that has been like learned and trained over time, and I've kind of gradually honed it. Maybe a combination of both. But that certainly like pulled me in. Um, and then, I mean, ultimately, it's a, a quest for like what is both true and useful. You know, I mean, I want ideas that are accurate, but I also don't just want like a scientific theory that's accurate for its own sake. I want something that that people can use that we can implement. And so I think my focus on like practical truths or uh, accuracy that can be usefully applied kind of naturally pulls me more towards ideas than some of the other other brand building stuff. Absolutely love it. We're talking with James Clear, jamesclear.com. Now, in, in unpacking habits, James, it's, it's tempting to kind of skip over some baseline things. And I, I, I struck a chord with a lot of things you wrote. But as a, as a getting started measure here, at one point very early in the book, you write, Habits don't restrict freedom, they create it. And because I've, I read a lot of your work, immediately I was like, okay, yep, I get that, let's move. Wait a minute, hold on a second. This sounds like a counterintuitive idea. And those are some of my favorite kind because on one hand, I know exactly what you mean, but I don't want listeners who haven't had a chance to read the book yet to just gloss over such a profound idea. When you say habits don't restrict freedom, they create it, I wonder if you can see how that appears at first glance as counterintuitive. Well, this is one of the common criticisms that I hear about habits or questions that people ask. And, you know, it's like, well, I don't want to be a robotic, you know, like I don't want to pigeonhole myself into a particular lifestyle. What about being, you know, having freedom? What about spontaneity? You know, like, does everything in my life have to be planned? And uh, what people fail to realize when they ask questions like that is it's a false dichotomy. Um, you know, so habits do not restrict freedom. They create it. And what I mean by that is if you look, the people who often have the, the least amount of freedom are the ones who have the worst habits. People who don't have good financial habits are always wondering where the next dollar will come from. People who don't have good fitness habits are always struggling for energy. People who don't have good learning habits are always feeling like they're behind the curve. 
And so it's really once you have your habits dialed in, once you've got the fundamentals of life handled and done, that you actually have the space to do the creative thing or the spontaneous thing or to take that trip that you just feel like taking that weekend or whatever. Um, and so in that sense, it's actually the, uh, the discipline of habits that creates the, the freedom of spontaneity. And, um, Jocko Willinks, uh, the Navy SEAL says something similar to this where he just says discipline equals freedom. But I think that's roughly what, uh, we're talking about here is this idea that by mastering the fundamentals, you create the space for, uh, the more creative and exciting and, um, and spontaneous opportunities. Yeah. Jocko's wristwatch. And that quote was exactly tip of tongue as you were saying that. So I knew exactly where you're going. It makes, it makes a lot of sense. And when you go right to the center of the book, um, you do resort to science. You, you, you don't just make things up and this isn't anecdotal. You talk about kind of a four step process that kind of works on some of the, the work by, by Skinner and, and Duhigg and, and Fogg and others. Um, you talk about Q, craving, response and reward. That's a big bear to unpack. But what was particularly fascinating to me was this line that you said, all behavior is driven by a desire to solve a problem. And I feel like as that a approaches those problem phase, solution phase, it's just a fascinating way to look at the science of, of habit. Can you open that up a bit? Yeah. So, you know, one way to think about a habit, a habit is uh, a behavior that you can perform more or less automatically, kind of like this mental shortcut that your brain can use. Um, but what is it shortcutting to? What is it, what is it using automatically? And one way to think about this is that habits are solutions to the recurring problems that you face. So for example, you know, if you wake up each morning and you put your shoe on and your shoe is untied, in a sense, that is a problem that you need to solve. And, uh, the first time that you tie your shoes, it's effortful and slow and you're learning how to do it. But then after you do it a hundred times or 500 times or a thousand times, pretty soon you're doing it on autopilot. You can tie your shoes without thinking about it. You can have a conversation with somebody else or think about what you need to do that day or whatever. And this is the role that habits serve in our lives. They are the solutions to the recurring problems that we face. And they are solutions that we can apply more or less on autopilot, which frees up your mind and cognitive resources to focus on other things that are important to you. And so um, in many ways, you can break down bigger habits in this, this same kind of format. So, for example, if you come home from work each day and you feel stressed and exhausted, then that is a problem and your brain starts looking for a solution. And maybe one person learns that the way to solve feeling exhausted after a long day at work is to play video games for an hour. And another person learns it's to go for a run for 20 minutes. And a third person learns it's to smoke a cigarette. And this is one of the key things to realize about habits is that they are solutions to the problems that you faced. But the original habit that you fall into is not necessarily the optimal one for solving the problems uh, that recur in your life. And once you realize that, then you start to be able to take a little bit more control of that process. And you can, you know, try to open up the box a little bit and think about what are these problems that I face day in and day out? What, what kind of things am I trying to solve? And then you can start to look for more effective solutions, for more effective habits for resolving those same kind of problems. Mm, that makes sense. But I think when you put in different habits, you try to plug in different habits into that four-step formula. Some of the, the the terminology gets a little bit confusing. So I know you talk a lot about working out and a lot of listeners here will definitely talk about a regular fitness habit. So when I look at the end of that cycle of reward, are we talking about just the feeling you get where you're, oh, I have a sense of accomplishment? Because some of the cue craving response reward gets difficult for, for me to figure out when you think of something like exercise. Sure. So one way to think about this is that every behavior produces multiple outcomes across time. Um, so, you know, people might say something like, well, you know, reward, like why, why do I smoke a cigarette then? How is that rewarding? And it's like, well, smoking a cigarette produces multiple outcomes. The immediate outcome might be favorable. Maybe it uh, helps you fit in with your friend who smokes or it reduces anxiety in the moment or, uh, you get the hit of nicotine, but the ultimate outcome, which is that it derails your health a year from now or five years from now or so on, uh, is unfavorable. And this is often the case for bad habits. The immediate outcome is favorable or enjoyable or satisfying in the moment. The ultimate outcome is unfavorable or unproductive or unhealthy. With good habits, it's often the reverse. Um, so going to the gym, the immediate outcome is often a little bit unfavorable. Like it takes effort and you have to sweat and work hard. 
But the ultimate outcome, if you continue the habit for another six months or a year, is favorable and healthy. And so much of the challenge of building good habits and breaking bad ones is about figuring out ways to pull the long-term consequences of those bad habits into the present moment so that you can feel a little bit of the pain right now and figuring out ways to pull the long-term rewards of your good habits into the present moment so you can feel a little bit of the satisfaction and pleasure right now and have a reason to repeat it. And this is something in the book that I refer to as the cardinal rule of behavior change, which is this idea that behaviors that are immediately rewarded get repeated and behaviors that are immediately punished get avoided. And it's really about the speed of feeling successful, the speed of feeling that sense of satisfaction that determines whether you want to repeat a habit again in the future. And um, there are a lot of interesting examples of this. So in businesses, uh, there are a couple products like uh, later in the book, I tell the story of chewing gum. Um, and for many years, chewing gum had been around, but it was kind of this like bland resin. It was chewy, but it wasn't really tasty. And then Wrigley came along in the 1880s and 1890s, and they added uh, spearmint and juicy fruit and double mint. And suddenly chewing gum had flavored, had this like immediate sense of satisfaction. It was tasty. And chewing gum took off as like this worldwide habit, and Wrigley became the, the largest chewing gum company in the world. And there are some, some more present uh, modern examples as well. So BMW, a couple years ago, they uh, added this system to, to their, some of their cars where if you step on the accelerator, it'll pump the sound of additional engine growl through the speakers. So it's like more satisfying to step on the gas. You get this additional rush or uh, noise. Ford is doing something similar where like if you really slam on the gas, it'll open up this little valve and let more of the engine noise in. But if you just drive like normal, it'll keep the engine noise out and have it soundproofed in a quiet ride. But the point here is that if you can figure out ways to feel more satisfied in the moment, to feel successful immediately, then you have a reason to show up and repeat it again. And so when I talk about that fourth stage of the reward, it's really about the immediate reward. It's about figuring out a way to feel immediately satisfied so that you have a reason to repeat the habit again in the future. I love that. Now, if I pull on that string, though, and I stay with working out, what what tactic do I use to make sure I feel it earlier? Because like you said, my tricep is burning, my quads are, are throbbing, and, and it's, I'm having a hard time find the, finding that potentially. Yeah, it's a great question. So there are a couple options here. Uh, the first thing is to realize that uh, there are many forms of the same habit. So, you know, some people like training like a bodybuilder or doing strength training stuff. But uh, for other people, they find more enjoyment in rock climbing or cycling or kayaking or whatever. And uh, this is true for any habit. Choose the one that feels the best to you, that is most enjoyable to you. You know, there are naturally going to be some experiences that are just more um, satisfying than others for different people. And so the best habit is the one that you feel satisfied with, that you want to stick with. Um, so that's the first thing is choose the habit that feels more appropriate in the moment or feels, feels more enjoyable, uh, the form of that habit. Um, the second thing is that many of our behaviors are socially reinforced. So, um, you know, we all are part of multiple tribes. Some of those tribes are large, like being American or being Australian or being French. Some of them are small, like what it means to be a member of your local CrossFit gym or to be a neighbor on your street. But all of those tribes, large and small, have a set of shared expectations. And when habits go against the grain of the shared expectations of the group, they're very unattractive. And when they go with the grain of the shared expectations, they're very attractive when we want to do them. So, you know, for example, just take like some common habits that people, everybody does. If you if you walk onto an elevator, you turn around to face the front. Or if you have uh, if you have a job interview, you wear a suit and a tie or a dress or something nice. Now, there's no reason it has to be that way. You could face the back of the elevator or wear a bathing suit to a job interview, but you don't because it violates the shared expectations of the group. And so many of the social reinforcements, feeling like you fit in, feeling like you're going to get praised from the people around you, having the approval and the respect of the tribe that you're in at that moment, that's a really powerful way to get some immediate satisfaction for doing the thing that you want to do. And so the, the punchline that I like to share here is you want to join a group where your desired behavior is the normal behavior. Because if it's normal in that group, you're not going against the grain of the expectations of the tribe. And you can get praised for, for doing the right thing. Um, so 
that's another way to add some additional reinforcement. And then there's a third, which is identity. And we can talk about that more if you'd like. Well, actually, while you were talking, I was trying to think of an example that would kind of thread the needle between both of the things you said. And when you landed that last line, I thought of the Navy SEALs, right? If it doesn't suck, uh, we don't do it, which it, which goes directly in the face of the first thing you said when you began talking. But then as you finished your point, I, I think I know where you're going, which is basically if you're a SEAL, you have some huge goals and some huge targets ahead of you, and the tribe requires and reinforces that behavior that we do badass things. Is that, is that on par? It's more satisfying to get the respect and approval of your fellow SEALs than it is difficult to do the hard thing. And so, um, you know, feeling like you belong, feeling like you've earned the right to be part of that group, to stay within that tribe is a really powerful motivator and sense of satisfaction, even if you're stuck in the mud for nine hours and freezing to death. I got you 100 percent. And I think that some people listening, when they think about trying to get in shape, start a writing habit, uh, do some do some things outside their comfort zone, see the social media, see the advertisement and say, that's what I need to do. And I think it would harken back to what you said earlier to try to pick the easiest one. That must be a mistake you see a lot of beginners in any endeavor make. Well, so this is one of the key parts of my philosophy is that habits should be easy to do, uh, small and easy to do. And uh, I just want to take a second to like uh, rectify that with what we just said about Navy SEALs doing really hard things or about the power of the social environment to nudge you along. And uh, the key thing here is that it's not that you'll never do difficult things. It's not that you shouldn't be ambitious. It's just that you should make it as easy as possible to do the things that pay off in the long run. And often we do not do that. We don't design our life to make the more important task the easier task or more convenient than it otherwise would be. So in many ways, our habits each day are just a consequence of what is easy and available to us. Like take like pulling out your phone, for example, I've started, um, I've started keeping my phone in another room until lunch each day. So I get a block of like three or four hours where I can work without my phone by me where I'm just focused. And I noticed an interesting thing when I started to do it, which is that we, we all are hooked on our phones. I think the average adult checks their phone over 150 times a day now. And, uh, it just keeps going up each year because we get more and more tied to them. But if I have my phone on me, if it's sitting next to me on the desk, then I'll look at it like every three minutes, but I have a home office. And so when I keep it in another room, it's only up the stairs and like 45 seconds away. But at no point during the morning, do I have this urge to go up and go get it? And so it's funny to me that I like, I'm going to pick it up if it's next to me. So in one sense, I do want to look at my phone, but I only want to look at it if the cost, if the friction is so low, if it's so easy that it doesn't require 45 seconds of work. I never want it that bad to walk up the steps. And uh, this is true for many of our behaviors. Like if you look at uh, what people eat, it's often the stuff that's most conveniently placed. This is why uh, grocery stores and shops will put the highest profit margin products on shelves at eye level because those are the ones people are more likely to see or more convenient to grab. Whereas stuff that's uh, less profitable is going to be tucked down like by your feet or on a lower shelf or whatever. Um, But the basic idea here is that If you can reduce the steps between you and the good behaviors, if you can reduce the friction associated with the habit, and you can increase the steps between you and the bad behaviors, then you're going to be in an an environment that suddenly makes the right choice the easier choice. And that's that's a powerful thing if you can start to do that in five or 10 or 20 different ways. Yeah. And you list a lot of them in the book. You talk about taking the batteries out of your remote control. You talk about Uh, putting an an, an adult beverage in the back of the fridge, even as extreme as unplugging the TV, to which my wife said, but I'll lose all my shows. (laughs) And and I think that speaks volumes to to some of our addictions as well. This seems like a great time to mention that, you you know, you're on a show called 1% Better, and we share a philosophy there for sure. I've been influenced by you, and uh, and I appreciate you coming on a show that's named that. It's something close to your heart. That's where it talks about getting just a little bit better. But I heard you recently say something that really unlocked a lot of the understanding for me and for my listeners, which is you, you're doing 1% better, but it's a thousand examples of that that makes the difference. So anyone who would poo-poo the philosophy may be thinking, oh, I want to get more than 1% better, but you go on and, and you write about it and you speak about it. It's really the sum total of a thousand little decisive points. I thought that was a huge point, James. 
Yeah, I think that that's one of the key ideas here. So uh, sometimes people are like, well, why did you choose the phrase atomic habits? And it's for a few reasons. Um, so the first is the word atomic means small or tiny. And as we just talked about, I think habits should be small and easy to do. But the second meaning of atomic is the fundamental unit of a larger system. So atoms build into molecules, molecules build into to compounds and so on. And that's really what we're talking about here when we're talking about layering these 1% improvements on top of each other. You're not looking to – each change that you make should be easy to do, should be uh, unintimidating and you know just trying to find a little margin for improvement each day. But you're not looking to just make one of those. You're looking to layer them on top of each other like atoms building into a molecule or molecules building into a compound uh, until you have this like really robust system that is all organized toward the same goal. Um, and so – if you do that, then you get to the third meaning of atomic, which is the source of immense energy or power. And I think if you put all three of those together, you make 1% changes, small changes that are layered on top of each other into a larger system, then you can end up with some powerful results. And that, that's why I chose the phrase atomic habits, because I think it encapsulates that kind of overarching narrative well. And in the conclusion to the book, I, I say... The holy grail of habit change is not a single 1% improvement. It's a thousand of them. You want them layered on top of each other. And so this really ultimately becomes about a philosophy of continuous improvement, a philosophy of trying to find that small margin for, uh, for getting better each day. And if you're willing to embrace that idea, to live that, that philosophy out, then it becomes less about any individual goal and more about this like endless refinement. Um, and people who are who are endlessly refining, who are willing to be relentless in their quest for a small 1% improvement each day, those are the people who actually end up mastering things. It's not necessarily the people with the biggest goals. It's the people with the best process. Mm. Atomic Habits. It's, it's my favorite title of the year. It could very well be my favorite book of the year. Was there even a second place finisher when you thought of titles? <laughs> yeah, we, uh, I brainstormed many, many titles, but that was definitely the one that we were most excited to go with. And it's interesting because I can imagine some readers looking at that title and, and not thinking of the small molecular atomic, but rather the damage that the atomic bomb would do or, or the big picture. And I feel like there's, as someone who loves words, I feel like there's something there where the, these little micro changes or, or habits lead to something either devastating in that case or just all and, and, and empowering. Well, I mean, this is one of the hard things about habits is that they are a double-edged sword. They can either compound for you or against you. And it's really not until two or five or 10 years later that the impact of your habits becomes fully apparent. And so in that sense, they can deliver devastatingly powerful results or um, remarkably enjoyable, powerful results. And I think that's one reason why the book is so important and why understanding habits in general is so important so that you can get them compounding for you rather than against you and uh, avoid the, the dangerous half of that double-edged sword. One of the ways that, that we do that is when you write, your brain is a reward detector. This is something we know from science. But it strikes me that that's an interesting thing to think about, right? Because my, my couple questions bubble to mind when I think about the brain as a reward detector. The first one's a little negative in the sense that it, it strikes me that that would be arguing that shaming or kind of really negative zings, if you will, would actually be remarkably effective in changing a habit. You don't write much about that, but I'm thinking of potty training. I'm thinking of things more sinister. Is that something you've seen in the research? Well, it's certainly true that people want to avoid pain and to pursue pleasure. And so uh, I guess we could say that your brain is both a reward detector and a consequence detector. Um, if it detects danger or pain or discomfort, then it wants to move away from those things or avoid those things. And if it detects reward or pleasure or satisfaction, it wants to move toward them. And, um, you know, we just talked about ways to make it satisfying for a habit. But the inverse of that, if you want to avoid a bad habit, you want to make it unsatisfying. You want to make it painful. You want to make it unenjoyable. Um, and so, uh, in a sense, those are like two sides of the same coin. Yeah, that makes sense. One of the things I wanted to ask about was was trying to improve a language or communication habit. In other words, something a little more abstract. How does something like becoming a better public speaker, a better communicator, or using the right words fit into this puzzle? Mm, yeah, that's a good question. So I think, first of all, let's just step back a little bit and um, get specific about the words that we're using right now. 
people use the phrase habit to describe a lot of things. And some of them aren't technically habits, even though that's how we, we use the phrase. So, you know, people might say something like, I want to get in the habit of writing every day. Well, that's fine. Um, but, and I know what you mean when you say that, but a habit in, uh, technically speaking is a behavior that can be performed more or less automatically. Well, writing is kind of like the antithesis of that. I mean, it's one of the most effortful things. You're going to be concentrating and thinking carefully about word choice and what you're writing on the page and which paragraph goes before the next one and all that type of stuff. So you're never going to just like write for an hour on autopilot uh, in a habitual way. And that's true for many of the areas that are most important to us. I mean, often the things that we care most deeply about, whether it's writing a book or doing um, really great work or our health and fitness they require some kind of like effort and attention. So I think the way to kind of marry these two concepts together, and it helps answer your original question about public speaking and word choice, is to actually use the habit as an entrance ramp to the behavior. So you habitualize the start of the task so that you make it more easy and automatic to get going each time. In other words, you like you effectively put discipline or motivation on autopilot by doing it the same way every single time to get started. And then once you're already past that on ramp and you've kind of like merged onto the highway, now you're moving in the right direction. And then you can, if you ask yourself to do some more effortful things or carefully thought through things, then you, you have the ability to do that, but you're already working on the right task. So let me give you a couple examples here. Um, I often refer to these as decisive moments. And what I mean by that is there's kind of a, a decisive moment, maybe just two or five minutes that determines what the next chunk of time is going to be like. And what you really want to master, what you want to habitualize is that decisive moment because it determines what's going to happen afterward. So, um, you know, every night there's a moment around kind of like five fifteen where my wife comes home from work and either we change into our workout clothes and we go to the gym or we sit on the couch and watch television or take out or whatever. And it's really not about the workout. Uh, it's really more about, do we change into our workout clothes? Cause if we do that, if we, if we just take that one action for those like three minutes, then everything else is already decided. Like I'm going to go to the gym. I'm going to get under the bar. I'll work out for an hour. It's all, it's all pretty much going to happen. Um, and so when you realize that the real thing to make a habit is not the workout, the workout's going to require effort and careful thought. And you think about what I'm going to do for the next set and so on. The real thing to habitualize is changing into your workout clothes during that decisive moment. Um, and so all the strategies that I talk about in the book, making habits more obvious, more attractive, more easy, more satisfying, you kind of direct all of that energy and attention, all those strategies that I outline toward that decisive moment. Um, in the case of public speaking, You've got kind of two things going on. Um, the first one is, well, how can we habitualize the start of practicing to be a better public speaker? Now, that might depend on what your goals are, what you want to do. But uh, maybe you need to habitualize the st getting started on working on a better presentation each morning and like, you know, coming up with a better, uh, a more beautiful design for the presentation. So really what you're trying to do there is habitualize the first two minutes of sitting down at the computer, opening up the presentation and working on the first slide. And then after that, you need to think carefully about what the rest of the presentation looks like. Or maybe you need to practice actually talking in front of a group. So at that point, you're trying to habitualize the first two minutes of getting in the car and driving to your local Toastmasters and presenting there or, you know, whatever the, the way is that you're going to practice that. But the point is figure out the behaviors that are going to give you the payoff you want and then scale it down to the first two minutes of that and figure out how to habitualize the beginning rather than worrying about making the whole thing this perfect habit. Yeah, I'm, I'm curious about uh, the author of Atomic Habits in the Clear Household. Who's, who's the accountability partner more often when, when your wife comes home and you're thinking about and you're debating whether it's, it's the office or it's workout? Well, this is the great thing about uh, marriage is that it's different <laughs> people for different things and it's different people at different times. So Last week, I didn't really feel like going to the gym one day. I was just exhausted from working on the book launch stuff, but she wanted to go. And so I was like, all right, fine, let's go. Um, and so she pulled me in. Uh, and then there have been plenty of other times where it's the other way. Uh, with cooking meals at, at home instead of eating out, she's the one who often keeps me on track uh, because she would rather uh, cook what we have than go out somewhere else. Um, but then there are other times when that's flipped. And so uh, it's a great thing about having someone who's like aligned with what you want to do or what you want to work on is that 
nobody is going to feel motivated every day. But if you are broadly on the same page, then a lot of the days, uh, at least one of you will, and that'll be enough to pull the other one on board. Yeah, I wanted to ask briefly about motivation. What is typically, the, in your mind, the relationship between motivation and habits? Is it that habits alleviate the need for constant motivation? Um, is it something else? Uh, it's something else. So um, the the second stage of the four stage model that I lay out in the book, which I call craving, but we could also call a prediction or an expectation. Um, that's where motivation occurs or where it fits into the, the overall model. And one way that I would describe this is that perceived value motivates you to act. Actual value motivates you to repeat in the future. And so let me give you a few examples. So when you buy a product on Amazon, it's not the product that you're buying. Um, and what I mean by that is you're buying the image of the product in your mind. You're the buying story. the expectation, right? The, the prediction. You're buying the perceived value that you believe you'll get from that product. You can't, you know, if you're buying a, a trampoline or something, you can't actually, you don't have it yet. It's just a picture on the screen. Yeah, in many so ways, your, I don't want to cut in, but in many ways, you're buying the story that you're the kind of family that has a trampoline in their yard. Yes, that's correct. That's the way to think about it. So there's before any behavior, there is some kind of story or prediction or uh, expectation that precedes it. And this is um, th th I mean, this makes sense when you talk through it. But it's a little counterintuitive for some people, because in a lot of ways, life feels reactive. But in me usually it's actually predictive. Uh, we're predicting what to do next or what action to take next. And so if the prediction is attractive, if it's favorable, then you have a reason to take action. And that reason, that prediction, that we just call that motivation. That's that's what happens. When you're when you're feeling motivated, the perceived value of taking that action seems high to you. And that's what we call motivation. Um, when a habit has been formed, that all happens more or less on autopilot. So take something really simple like uh, turning on the light switch when you walk into a dark room. So in the book, the four stages I lay out are cue, craving, response, and reward. So cue, you walk in, you notice that the room is dark. Craving, you want to be able to see. So you predict that there will be more value in the room being lit than in it being dark. And that motivates you to act. So craving, you want to be able to see. Response, you flip on the light switch. Reward, you get to be able to see the room is now lit up. And all of that, those four stages, I mean, that happens in a fraction of a second. And so these these four processes or these four stages, we're going through that process endlessly. It's happening all the time, um, even right now as you're listening to this. And uh, really what I'm describing there is not only the process of habit formation, but the process of learning. That's that's what it's like to go through life and to pick up on different cues, to experience the external world, to predict what will happen if you take a particular action in that context or in that circumstance you take the action and then you learn. Then you figure out if that was productive or not and you update your expectation for the next time around. And uh, and so that's kind of how motivation and prediction kind of fit together in that second stage and where they, they fit in the overall scheme of habits. Mm. Talking with James Clear, uh, you're not, you don't strike me as a combative person, but is there anything out there in the world of habit uh, vocabulary that you would like to set straight from your research? Uh, a myth that persists you want to go myth busting a little bit? <laughs> um, well, okay. So there's like two things. Um, the first one is very related to what we just talked about. Uh, pretty much very few of the habit models or behavior models that you will see will have some stage that accounts for the prediction that precedes behavior. But I think it's actually crucial. Um, you know, it's crucial for two reasons. The first is understanding what makes the difference between two people. Like why, why would one person look at a pack of cigarettes and want to smoke, feel this undeniable craving to smoke, and another person looks at them and uh, doesn't want to smoke at all? And it, it's all about what happens in that prediction phase. It also explains uh, the wild difference in behavior that you can see in people in many different circumstances. So like uh, politics is a, a great example. You can have the same news story run on, on television and a liberal views the story and comes to one conclusion and a conservative views the story and comes to another conclusion. Same data point, same story, uh, but very different outcomes, very different responses based on that prediction, uh, based on the filter that they run it through. 
And so uh, my point there is is just that uh, craving and prediction is a very important part of the behavioral process for for any behavior, but certainly for habits as well. And then the the second myth that I'll talk about is probably the most common question I get, which is how long does it take to build a habit? Yes, and I knew it was coming, James. You'll see all kinds of stuff for this, right? Like you'll see you'll see people say 21 days or 30 days or 66 days is the most common one that's going around right now because there was there was this one study that found that on average it took about 66 days to build a habit. Which, broadly speaking, I think that can be fairly useful. Um, you know, it tells you, all right, look, this is going to take a couple months. This isn't going to be a quick fix. But um, the honest answer to that question, how long does it take to build a habit, is forever. Because if you stop doing it, it's no longer a habit. Um, and in a way, the question, how long does it take to build a habit, kind of has a, it has an implicit assumption behind it, which is, how long do I need to work on this before it's easy? How long do I need to work on this before I don't have to put effort in anymore? And it views a habit as like a finish line to cross. But habits are not a finish line to cross. They're a lifestyle to be lived. And I think we need to, to shift our viewpoint of that, shift our mindset of that, and view habits as how can I make a sustainable change, a lifestyle change that I can stick with day in and day out, a 1% improvement that uh, I can actually follow 98% of the time without fail. And if you can't do that, then you're probably talking about something too big or you're you're really not looking to build a habit. You're looking to achieve a goal or cross a finish line. And um, there's not necessarily anything wrong with that. But I think almost all of the great rewards in life come from repetition and mastery and hab habitualizing the uh, the areas that are most important to you. So. A lot of that, I think, is uh, I guess what I'm really calling for there is not necessarily busting the myth as much as uh, shifting a mindset. Yes, yes, yes. I'm nodding my head. If I wouldn't knock my microphone over, I'd be I'd be pounding my fist on the table. I love it. I love it. It, it reminds me an awful lot of uh, just a simple line where you say that it's the it's the number of times you perform something that's that's of more value than the time spent doing it. And I, I think that's a key piece that's that's related to it. Somewhere else late in the book, James, you mentioned something that I think is life-changing, and I think there's a lot of implications that could do that, and I don't mean to overstate that. But at some point, you talk about whether it's a workout or it's, it's a, something else. You, you say, don't have two bad days. You know, I, I think we've spent a lot of time talking about working out just because it's an incredible metaphor. But the point is, a lot of people listening, and myself, I've been guilty of this, where you say, I'm not feeling it today. I'm not going to go because it's going to be a quote unquote waste of time, but that is the exact opposite of what you aspire to and what you write in the book. You say those are the days where you really, you kind of earn your money, so to speak. Well, this is true, not just for, uh, for fitness habits. It's true for any habit, you know? So for a long time, uh, when I launched jamesclear.com, I had this writing habit where I would publish a new article every Monday and Thursday. And I did that for the first three years. And it was really that writing habit that led to the growth of the site and ultimately got me the book deal. And, um, and yeah, it was just like built the business up and, and been kind of the key element into the success of my business. And like anybody, uh, I am not perfect. And so if I miss, then the, the key mantra that I like to keep in mind is never miss twice. And this is true for any habit, you know, like you can, write four blog posts in a row or go to the gym uh, for two weeks straight or uh, write a little bit of your book for three weeks in a row. But at some point, life gets crazy or you get sick or you have to uh, take your kid to the doctor or do some kind of thing gets in the way. And when that happens, a lot of the time people fall into this all or nothing cycle where they feel like, oh, I was doing this diet and then my friends wanted to go to happy hour. And so I went out and I had some drinks with them and then I binge ate and I just like blew it. So I guess I'm not cut out to like do this diet anymore. Um, but when I look and study the people who achieve remarkable results in pretty much any field, it's not that they're perfect. It's not that they don't make mistakes. They make mistakes just like everybody else. But the thing that's key is they get back on track quickly. And so this idea of never miss twice, I think is a crucial thing to keep in mind because yeah, sure. Maybe you wish you hadn't binge ate with your friends. Um, but just because you did it once, let's put all of our energy now into making sure the next meal is a healthy one. Or maybe I wish I hadn't missed my Monday, Thursday article schedule, but let me put all of my effort into making sure I get an article out for the next one. And 
you see this in a lot of areas. It's often not the the first mistake that ruins you. It's like the spiral of repeated mistakes that follows. And so if you can cut that off at the source and get back on track quickly, you really give yourself a great opportunity to to have some really powerful rewards over the long run. I mean, in a way, this is kind of about getting out of this like 24-hour or 48-hour cycle of judging your results like right then uh, and looking at things on a broader time scale. You know, like what's the – if you get back on track quickly, if you never miss twice, well, what is like binge eating once uh, over a six-month span? It's nothing. It's just a blip. But if you let that spiral into a, a new habit, a bad habit, a, a pattern that isn't what you want, well, then it starts to become something more substantial. So I think uh, never miss twice is uh, something that's helped me with that. Mm, so much value. Moments moments left in our conversation, James. Uh, I don't want to ask a lazy question and say, what's the secret? So I'll, I'll say it to you this way. Um, you've been prolific every Tuesday, Thursday for so long. I know you don't believe in jinxing anything, so I will say this is bound to be a wildly successful, and as Ryan Holiday would say, a perennial seller. Um, I know that to be true. Um, what is the separator, though, for you? How have you become so productive? What If you had to just kind of reduce that down, what, what has it been, James? Oh, well, thank you. Uh, I'm very grateful to, to hear that and to hear that you're finding it useful and, and helpful. Um, I don't know. I mean, I don't really think that I have it figured out, to be honest. You know, in a lot of ways, I'm still trying to revise and update and improve my approach, which, to be, you know, ties in directly with what I talk about in Atomic Habits, this idea that we should be re uh, endlessly refining and kind of relentlessly trying to improve what we're working on. So I guess in a sense, we could say it's that. Um, but I do have a couple things about like my style of writing that I think have helped. Um, the first one is I want things to be simple, to be easy to understand. A lot of the, the topics that I talk about are complex. I mean, human behavior is maybe the most complex topic. Uh, it's endlessly hard to predict is, uh, you have to understand a lot of different areas of research. I mean, there's in just in the book, there are ideas from neuroscience, biology, psychology, philosophy, um, a variety of areas. And so no one person can hope to be an expert in all of that, but I do my best to understand the core ideas, the core principles, and then distill them into something that's simple. The second aspect is I want it to be actionable and practical. Um, you know, like understanding knowledge just for knowledge's sake is, is great, but I really want stuff that people can apply to daily life and work. And then the third and I think final key piece of it, you know, is just um, the storytelling. And, you know, Atomic Habits has, I don't know, at least a dozen, maybe two dozen stories in it. And I think that those examples are crucial for giving the theories, for giving the ideas life, for making people understand how to apply them and what they look like in the real world. And I notice that, you know, if I'm when I give speeches or talk at a company or something, almost it's almost never the research that people talk to me about afterward it's always the stories um and uh humans are wired to, to understand stories and to get them and so i want to make sure that i have those integrated as well but on a foundational level i mean all those things matter but the thing that matters more than anything else is just showing up um and that's true for writing it's true for lifting it's true for a lot of areas people try to optimize the last the things that make like the last 2% of difference, you know, people try to get in shape and they'll say things like, well, what knee sleeve should I get? Or what protein powder is best? Or what, you know, what running shoes do I need? But it's like, you know, just don't miss workouts and put in your reps and get back to me in two years. Um, that's the thing that makes the biggest difference. <laughs> it's not sexy though. It's not sexy it's not. to say that, you know, it's true. It's true. It's not, but it's the, the same thing is true for writing or for anything else. You know, I mean, I, on a, on a certain level, we could say, well, you know, I wrote an article every Monday and Thursday for three years, and I usually spent 10 to 20 hours on each article, and I tried my best each time. <laughs> and three years later, I had something good to show for it. But a lot of people don't put in those reps, and uh, that's nothing magical or really nothing even to, like, praise me for intelligence or anything like that. It was just showing up that made a huge difference. Um, and... Uh, and that honestly is kind of a lesson for habits in general. It's really about putting in your reps. Yeah, I think you write uh, standardize, don't don't optimize. Yes, this is a crucial thing. I mean, this is something that people it, it when you this is especially important in the beginning of any process. But when you translate it to habits, uh, sometimes it strikes people as surprising. So the the thing that I recommend in the book is what I call the two minute rule, where you take 
whatever habit you're trying to build and you scale it down to just the first two minutes. And I had a reader who did something like this. He, he ended up losing over a hundred pounds. And the way that he did it was he went to the gym, but he wouldn't allow himself to stay for longer than five minutes. So sounds crazy, but he would like show up, he'd go in, do half an exercise or something. And then five minutes would be up and he'd, he'd leave. And he did this for like, like six months. And, um, if you think about it, it's the exact opposite of what most people do when they try to get in shape. Most people get all amped up and try like a really difficult program and then, you know, fizzle out after three, three weeks or whatever. But what was so useful about it is he was mastering the art of showing up. And this is a crucial thing about every habit. A habit must be established before it can be improved. You know, so often we're focused on finding the perfect diet plan or the perfect business idea or the perfect uh, strength training program. And all of that stuff is just kind of wasted if you don't master the art of showing up. If you're not there each day, there's nothing to optimize. And, uh, and so by focusing on just the first five minutes, um, he became the type of person who always went to the gym. And once he was that type of person, well, then he had all kinds of options. And so I think you want to standardize before you optimize. You want to optimize for the starting line, not the finish line. And if you can do that, if you can become the type of person who shows up every day, then you have a lot of choices. The book is Atomic Habits, Tiny Changes, Remarkable Results, An Easy and Proven Way to Build Good Habits and Break Bad Ones. James, when I, when I told people I was interviewing you, several people listed you among their favorite writers. I know you don't want to hear that because you're going to deflect the praise. But I want to say as well, I put you in that category. This has meant an awful lot to me. Um, I want to thank you publicly. The, uh, the last word is yours, my friend. Oh, well, thank you so much. I appreciate the opportunity. And uh, I'm very excited to share the book with everyone. If you'd like to check it out, it's called Atomic Habits, and you can get it at AtomicHabits.com. Uh, in addition to the book being there, there are some extra bonuses and downloads. So there's a, a bonus guide for how to apply the ideas to business. There's a guide on how to apply the ideas to parenting and a variety of worksheets and templates and, uh, and things that will help you track your habits or implement uh, some of the ideas in the book. So all of that is at AtomicHabits.com. He's James Clear. Thank you guys so much for listening to 1% Better. Hard to imagine you didn't get at least 1% better. But as James mentioned, it's about stacking those habits up over time. I want to thank James Clear for being here today.